<coughs> Nina, thank you. Um, when you asked for the title of my talk, I think we emailed back, Playful Simplicity, and you said, are you serious? <laughs> that can't cover it. Well, I can say, in the Netherlands, we take play very serious, and simplicity is even a more serious thing. But now I will start to shout about the museum. We've been busy on renovating, on making the new Rijksmuseum for the past 10 years. A long time, and it's nearly half the time that it took you to build this great institution, which one can't think away anymore from the landscape of research in decorative arts. When you get the opportunity to reinvent a national museum, to renovate it, to transform it, I think in the States you call it an extreme makeover, <laughs> you have to go back to the beginnings, or at least that's what we decided. Why were we founded? The Rijksmuseum was founded, just to short freshen up, at the beginning of the 19th century as the National Museum for Art and History. It was founded at a time when the borders in Europe were affirmed as we know them today. In 1885, the building of the Rijksmuseum opened, you see it here on the slide, a cathedral for the arts and history of the Netherlands, built by Pierre Kuipers, a fierce Catholic. And I'll get that back to that in a short while. It embodied the collection in the sense that it used Dutch bricks, Dutch stone and Dutch architectural styles. It had a very clear layout, a clear floor plan that radiated simplicity. But over the 20th century, it was cluttered with small offices, small rooms, and it was hard to find one's way. It became like a maze. A lot of people would enter the decorative art exhibition spaces and would, without kind of being a bit courageless, escape after not finding their way in a very short period of time. Here you see the way that was done. The original courtyards were filled up with little rooms in the 1950s and the clutter continued. We invited two Spanish architects, I think very typical of the Netherlands. We were at war in the 17th century with the Spanish. We build a monument to our country, but invite the Spanish to redo it. Cruz and Ortiz. They brought back light to the gallery. They brought back um, the Kuipers building and we gave them two tasks. One, to give the building back to the public. The building, like the collection, is everyone's building, everyone's collection. And to take Kuipers architecture into the future. They started by taking out all the rubble and I can say when all the rubble was taken out the building actually lifted five inches because it became lighter and it became more spacious. They wanted to go back to the original very simple floor plan of Kuipers considering that the building is like a human body. What you see is the two courtyards, they function as the lungs of the museum, the museum can breathe. The gallery of honor in the middle, let me see if this works. Yeah, the gallery of honor in the middle and beating at the heart of it, the room with the night watch. But as we all know, simplicity is often the most <laughs> complex thing to get to. This is not a joke. <laughs> simplicity, I, I really firmly believe, and I think that that's why it took us 10 years. Simplicity is very complex to get to. 
and that's the theme basically of this talk um when in the netherlands you start to build you have to um rent a captain at sea or divers because we're below sea level and this is the type of construction work that built the new museum it resulted into a museum with light with space where one can breathe and that's there to welcome the 21st century public but getting back to Kuipers as a Catholic he built a building which was a cathedral to the arts and history that was meant to lift people out of their daily situation to admire the arts and history over the 20th century though the building which was considered to be far too catholic for a city like amsterdam a protestant city was painted white you here see the front hall everything was painted white and you see an organ was hung just as if it was a protestant church i think modernism helped white was fashionable and it was easy to paint away the decorations Stingy as we are, the Dutch kept the windows because they served a function. <laughs> this is the front hall, the same front hall, just to go back, as you see it today. We decided that the building itself as a monument should speak in certain places, and in other places the collection speaks. Ten years of restoration, reconstruction done by a lot of young new decorators restorers who were learning a trade that was nearly lost this is what the gallery of honor looked like when we closed as you see at that time colors in galleries were fashionable but in general it was painted white and this is how it looks today you see a strong contrast between what's old and what's new. We wanted to contrast old and new to show what belongs to the original building and which were additions made by Cruz and Ortiz and later Villemot, to whom I will come back. Cruz and Ortiz brought back the original volumes of the building. In the 20th century as well, the galleries had been split up here. These galleries were the decorative arts galleries that were split up into four rooms, creating extra wall space. We wanted to go back to the original volumes and it should ra they should radiate tranquility. But then you come back to the core question what distinguishes us from other museums and this is very important when you start rearranging your display of your collection and i think what makes us what makes the Rijksmuseum unique is that it has three national collections in it here you see the fine arts collection sculpture but mainly painting when the museum opened so it was the national museum of arts fine arts it was the national museum of history and here you see the 1960s history museum in the Rijksmuseum as you can see very much reflecting the idea of the 19th century and democratizing the collection and here you see the National Decorative Art Museum um, at the end of the 19th century. So it houses three museums which normally are divided. When you consider the Rijksmuseum, and I think that that's one of its distinguishing points as well, when you consider it like a memory, like we have our personal memory, this is the Rijksmuseum, is the collective memory of a nation. And in this period after postmodernism, chronology seems to be a great ordering principle. If you think of your own life, 
you think of important dates in it. You make your photo album, the birth of your first child, a marriage, a death. Those are moments in time in which you order your memory. So we thought what we want to do is we want to combine these three museums and make a passage through time of the national collective memory. The motto for that was a sense to create with the visitor a sense of time and a sense of beauty. The building lends itself perfectly for that. Each floor was assigned a century. And the idea is that on each floor you step into a century and when walking through it you get a sense of beauty and a sense of the passing of time. From the Middle Ages and the Renaissance in the vaults of the building to the 17th century to the 18th century walking into the 19th century and then at the top of the building the 20th century a new era in which the Rijksmuseum embarked. We embarked in it because we feel that the National Museum our collective memory is never cl a closed chapter. It is there for next generations and it should continue into the 20th century and later into the 21st century. We asked Jean-Michel Villemot to help us with the installation of the collections. The, some would say the decoration, but I think with Villemot you can't really say that. We chose him because of the Louvre, the work he did there, and the work especially in the Art Premier of the Louvre. I don't know if you've all seen the collections of the Art Premier. What he did is he, he focused on each object. He made a transparent and open exhibition space where the showcases really present to the public single objects which you can appreciate to their full extent. So again, we chose him because of the simplicity of his installations and the object is central in his installations. But then the difficult task started, the work. Groups of curators were formed, and I have to say this took some diplomacy because they suddenly had to install the galleries together, where the curator of ceramics had before his own gallery, he suddenly had to sit next to the curator of furniture and next to the curator of paintings, and they had to decide how to install the galleries together. If we would have opened after five years, which we told the government we would, of course, um, the installation wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have come to full fruition. I see it as a form. You start like this, you then develop your ideas, and they become very broad and very complex. And then the second five years we took to make this very complex installation to bring it back to simplicity again. Here you see the vaults where the Middle Ages and Renaissance are presented. And you see what I meant with Villemot really presents the objects on a platter to the public. Mix where you can, divide where you have to, was the other motto. Mix the collections of decorative arts, of paintings, of history where you can but don't always do it divide it where they need to be divided we started off mixing everything nearly as out of a principle and i think that we came to the conclusion that often parallel displays work very well as well a room with paintings a room with decorative arts a room with historical objects they kind of 
create the rhythm of the museum. One important decision was we did not want to create period rooms like you see here in the old museum. We felt that in a way that was betraying the public to give the suggestion that these chairs belong to the table. We didn't want to do that. So the display is rigorously different. And note the chimney piece here. This is how it looks today. Important in it is less is more. We prefer the public to be able to concentrate on single pieces. This is a room about the official duties of um, the burghers of Amsterdam. Women in their official positions, um, men in their official positions. And here you see what I meant, I hope, with focus. You focus on single works of art, but also they create a context to each other. The portrait busts of burgomasters, depicted as Roman senators nearly, and there in the middle, Carl Dujardin, a painting um, depicting man again in their official um, function in the town. Let me give you one example of how this combining decorative arts, paintings and history works. Here you see Van Vianen, a beautiful um, set depicting the Battle of Newport, a very important moment in the 18 years, 80 years war against the Spanish. This is how it used to be exhibited next to the objects, um, to the silver of the Van Viana family. In a showcase, quite a large quantity of objects. And this is how we display it today. You see it here in a showcase on its own with what we feel the right way to display it, the vase on top of the plate. Um, in the context of the beginning of the young republic of the Netherlands. Paintings, decorative art, historical objects um, displayed alongside each other, where I feel that we don't really make a distinction anymore between that's decorative art or that's history or that is art. In a sense, all art is history as well. When it comes to decorative art, in the beginning we had many discussions about doesn't the decorative art lose out? We can display less than we could before. But I'm convinced that for the public the decorative arts have gained. People have less and less of a reference when they think about the past. And here you see a room with young Rembrandt, his friend Domer, Lambert Domer here, with the cabinet, and Lutma in the showcases. Where people will know who Rembrandt is and they will find it quite easy to look at because everybody, like we today, is used to looking at flat surfaces, two-dimensional, they will find it harder to look at um, three-dimensional objects. And they will just, if they see decorative arts galleries, they might just pass. That's why in the old museum, the decorative arts galleries often were quite empty and everybody was cluttered around Rembrandt. Now, in this new installation, we find that there are many more visitors looking at the cabinet, looking at the silver of Lutma, because you get them in, maybe with Rembrandt or Vermeer, but you start them, uh, you start to, they start to look at other things as well. Things to which they can relate, things that they might have in an IKEA version in their homes. I said no decor or no uh, period rooms, to the exception of two rooms, um, one which you might have seen in the old museum, but this one I wanted to show you, the Boningenkamer, 
which is um, we allowed these two period rooms because they really display the original objects that belong to that room. We completely restored this room w because we felt we wanted to give the public who might come to the Netherlands for a few hours for one day to give the public the possibility to walk through one of those opulence rooms from the Rococo um, which were in the canal houses. So this is a room transported from a canal house which has always been created in our storage rooms and now restored and the public can actually roam through it. As I said, the motto was less is more and we wanted to focus on the objects. Let the objects speak and let them tell their story. So what you see as well is that we have no computers in the rooms. It's the authenticity, the experience of the authenticity that we believe is important for our public. To give an idea of the wealth of the collection, we um, wanted to have a kind of open depot where the people who would like to study more could go to, we call it the special collections, and could see art in great numbers. Jean-Michel Villemot said, I want it to be like a bijouterie, where you see objects in an opulent, beautiful location. Here you see part of the Armeissen collection, which is one of the most beautiful in the world, but is again in great quantity in the museum. Upstairs you see um, a few pieces highlighted, for example, the birds we have, but downstairs you see larger quantities for study. Now we come to Irma Baum. And why Irma Baum? because of her playful simplicity. She did everything for the museum when it comes to graphic design. And I think that's one of the great things when you redo a national museum in one go, that you can also be very consistent with the design. She started with the logo, and we'd had a competition for that, which came out with very complex logos and Irma said what's the strongest logo my answer was even though I don't wear it Chanel and she said yes because it's a word so we should come to a word Rijks Museum playful simplicity she did the guidebook where she cuts off the word museum sometimes you see museum sometimes you see Rijks it is really a way to play with the logo, but also a way to make the museum of today and of tomorrow. What I often say, we show old masters for tomorrow's public. And I think that the Netherlands, in their graphic design, have always been very strong at a clear line, at bringing simplicity. If you look at the design of the museum in the 1970s, it is very modern but at the same time also timeless. When closed we thought we want to bring the collection to the public because it's everybody's collection and we decided to do that through Reich Studio. Also there we chose for simplicity. It was the time and we think now that it ha they have been there for always but it was the time when apps on your telephone became very popular and the first one I downloaded for a one-year-old child was drums. The simplicity of this app is very strong. It just shows drums, you tap them and they make a noise, drives parents crazy. Um, <laughs> but it is about the limitations of the app that makes them so popular. When you think of the museum, the main power of the museum to attract people is the power of the image and the internet is very image orientated so we decided to always have again the collection the image as the point of departure and to use the images for the apps 
it's about looking but the great thing of the iPad it's also about touching something you can't do in the museum you can touch the collection at home at any time of the day and also at any place in the intimacy in front of an open fire or a stove but it's also about making a lot of the, of our uh, colleagues make repositories of their images they digitize we put them on the web but we felt it's very important that enabled to remember images you should give people the possibility to do something with them i don't know most of you probably like me when we studied history of art started to make their own photographic collection clippings you put them away and you think, oh, I'd write a paper about that one day. You probably never write the paper, but the action of clipping itself makes you remember the object. So playing with the collection, clipping in the collection, making dresses, these were for the opening of the museum of the collection, makes you remember the objects. <laughs> the goal is to be in everybody's home, to be on every breakfast table, to be branded, to have the images of the museum branded on every um, breakfast table in every house. I'd rather have people look at art than look at toy guns. Um, the other thing of the museum, why we're there, is to educate. And what we did for the opening of the Rijksmuseum, the whole, all the milk packs in the country, in the Netherlands that's quite a lot, um, where had a, an image of an object from the Rijksmuseum on them. And you can imagine if you're a small child and you sit at the table, you look at this image. And at the same time, under it, it had a little riddle about that object, which you could find the answer to. So it's again also education. We don't only do this for fun, we take the collection very serious. Then the museum opened. Again, great simplicity, fireworks, trumpets. <laughs> yeah, you won't believe it, but this wasn't that expensive. Um, trumpets, we asked, what's, we asked all the bra brass bands from all the Dutch provinces to come to the Rijksmuseum and they walked through the passageway into the city um, the opening the celebration of a collective memory for everyone the question is often asked if you have all these images on the web will people come to the museum still because they can see them at home the answer is yes they will the more you are on people's mind the more they will want to see the real thing. I always take it as, a, as an example, if there wouldn't be all those vendors of fake Louis Vuitton bags um, on the street corner, Louis Vuitton would sell far less. As soon as people can, they want to see the original. So don't be afraid to open your collection on the web to everybody. And yes, they came in great numbers. We, were, we opened in April and we'll probably already have 2 million visitors by the end of the year. And that for a small city as Amsterdam is a huge number. To give a comparison, MoMA, 1.5 million visitors a year. So why do people come? Because it's everybody's collection. The museum... Museums are everyone's collection. The great thing is that it is impossible to own great art. It is everyone's. Museums are places to learn about the past for the future. The places of celebration of the achievements of mankind and their places of inspiration. But the key thing is trust in the collection. Trust in the authentic objects that give an experience that you cannot get anywhere else. You can go shopping, 
that you can do in every city in the world and you'll see more or less the same shops but the collection is great because for once you can't buy what's in it and it is different from anywhere else you go and don't tell your story and look for the objects with it but let the objects tell their story and i think that was done in a great way in the met when we had this masterpiece of Runchen travel there the objects tell their story and those stories together make our collective memory i think it's now where i started to scream it's time for me to shut up and let the object speak. Thank you very much. Thank you for that inspiring journey through this new and amazing place.